1984 draft, there really was a 1984 aspect to it. George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, described a bleak world. Big Brother controlled everything. Orwell's central character, Winston Smith, dared to question Big Brother's power. The NFL really was kind of a Big Brother figure and, uh, you know, was just this all-encompassing sports power. In our world, there will be no love but the love of Big Brother, no laughter but the laugh of triumph over a defeated enemy. No art, no science, no literature, no enjoyment, but always and only Winston, there will be the thrill of power. And, you know, here comes the USFL after the NFL had been unchallenged for nearly two decades and was, you know, trying to move in on its territory. Big Brother was watching, and but in this, in this situation, unlike the movie, I think Big Brother was a little scared. I had been in the NFL for almost eight years with the Philadelphia Eagles and then left the Big Brother, the security blanket, to go to this new venture, Pro Football in the Spring, United States Football League. And I think at that time, the antagonism between the two leagues began to grow. It became a taffy pull. There was, uh, I don't like to say animosity, but there, there became a growing concern. Unlike the 74 draft, this draft would be televised. What viewers couldn't see, however, was the behind the scenes war for players between the rival leagues leading up to the 84 draft. We're fighting for players, and players are the very essence of professional football. If we didn't have them, we would be off Broadway. We want to be on Broadway. They were going to have their draft in January and play in May. And the NFL didn't have the draft until May. So you could get, you could be drafted by the USFL, <laughs> signed and gone before you ever had a chance to be drafted by the NFL. They were really trying to compete. They were really throwing around a lot of money. A lot of guys were saying, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. In 1984, Maryland quarterback Boomer Esiason was caught dead center in the war between the two leagues. I told Big Brother that I didn't want to play for the USFL, that I always wanted and envisioned myself as an NFL Big Brother quarterback, if you will. And my agent lambasting me for saying, don't say that, don't say that, we need leverage. And I kept saying to him, I don't want to play in the USFL, I want to play in the NFL. But many others did. Stars like Jim Kelly and Herschel Walker had already bolted to the USFL. Big Brother was not happy. In 1984, they went on a signing spree and pretty much picked the 1984 draft clean. Herschel Walker and future Hall of Famer Reggie White should have been eligible for the 84 draft, but they had been signed by the USFL as underclassmen. The USFL also stole away three Heisman Trophy winners, including Mike Rozier, who would have been a top NFL pick. Uh, Houston Oilers offered me $2.8 million for three years. Pittsburgh Mullers gave me $8 million guaranteed. So you do the math, what, what would you do? But the biggest fight was over quarterback Steve Young. The multi-talented BYU star was being hounded by both the LA Express and the Bengals. Cincinnati had the first pick in the NFL draft. They had Ken Anderson there, and Ken Anderson was a Pro Bowl type player. So Steve clearly was not going to start if they took him, and they would take him. We were ready to sign him. In fact, Mike Brown was boarding a plane in Cincinnati to meet him in Salt Lake City to sign the deal that we would have had Steve Young as our quarterback. We made the phone call and the agent didn't answer and Steve Young didn't answer. We didn't get on the plane and found out that night that he just signed with the uh, USFL, the uh, LA Express, I believe it was. Young signed a record $40 million contract and was playing for the Express before the NFL's May draft even took place. I fundamentally left college to play. If you would have said, you're gonna spend you know, a year backing up, I'd be like, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that. Not that I couldn't or wouldn't or I'd end up doing it, it just wasn't on my radar screen. I was shocked when he signed, because I really thought in his heart that he wanted to be an NFL quarterback too. 
but it would be hard to turn down that kind of money when it's laid out in front of you. After Young's signing, NFL war rooms were in a panic. Anxious GMs hurriedly sent their legions out to look at other quarterbacks. San Diego scout Red Phillips was on the case. He was searching for an eventual replacement for Dan Fouts. One of his candidates was a quarterback from West Virginia. I'm really interested uh, how strong a kid is uh, Jeff Hostetter. You mean to tell me that this kid has got a four-point average? Jeff, I don't think, is a classic passer, but he's a good passer. And the big thing, he knows who to get the ball to. He sees very, very well. He has great vision on the field. He's somewhat like Dan Fouts that we have in the fact that he does read coverages very well, and he does have this good size and strength and durability factor. He's got him. He's got him. He's got him. There he is, man. That's it. He popped that in real good. Jeff, congratulations on the ball game. I know it was a big win for you. San Diego Charter be keeping an eye on you. We really, we really think you did a good job. Good luck to you. Tampa Bay needed a quarterback too, but had traded away their first round pick to the Bengals the year before for Jack Thompson, the throw-in Samoan. That pick became number one overall. It changed hands again a month before the draft. The Bengals, failing in their somewhat reluctant courtship of quarterback Steve Young, passed their number one pick in this year's draft onto the Patriots for a number of lower selections. The Patriots didn't want their top choice to be lured away by the USFL, so they started negotiations right away. Irving Fryer would be the number one pick, and he'd be announced and signed three weeks before draft day. And so that kind of took some of the excitement out of it in terms of draft day and all, and the anticipation. Uh, and, and just the explosion when it does happen, it just, it kind of took that away. Nineteen eighty four was just the fifth year the NFL draft was available to television viewers. With much of the top talent gone to the USFL, it was not must see TV. Steve Young was among the departed leaving Maryland's Boomer Esiason as the draft's top-rated quarterback. What are you doing there? Like Orwell's poor Winston, Boomer was watched closely. Lost and confused, he wondered where his future would be. I did not have a party, didn't have a lot of people around me. We all were expecting a phone call, you know, before noon that afternoon, saying that I was going to be the next quarterback or drafted by the, this team, that team, or whatever. Pre-draft buzz had the Giants possibly taking him at number three overall to replace injury-prone Phil Simms. Or perhaps the fourth pick, where Philadelphia might take an heir apparent for Ron Jaworski. If he lasted to number seven, the Bengals, looking for a young quarterback for new coach Sam Weish, seemed like a good fit. There was one place he would not end up. Right around that spring, the team that I probably should have been the quarterback for loaded up the Mayflower moving vans and moved out of Baltimore and went to Indianapolis. And Boomer Esiason, loyal Terp that he was, said, I don't care if they draft me, I'm never going to step foot on the field for the Indianapolis Colts. For the outspoken lefty, the drama was just beginning. For the top two picks, there was very little drama. Now, this is dramatic. All right, the Patriots select Irving Fryer, wide receiver in Nebraska, first pick in the, in the first round. There was no surprise in that first draft. Billy Sullivan stepping up and making it clear from the beginning that not only is Irving Fryer their selectee, but in addition, he is already signed, sealed, and delivered. Irving Fryer was the NFL's top pick only after he spurned the USFL. I remember sitting in uh, Donald Trump's office in New York, Trump Tower. They wouldn't guarantee my contract, so I told them no. And I'm like, you got all this money, man? You can't guarantee my contract? What's up? Had to be a good negotiating position for you, because obviously two leagues were bidding for your services. Oh, yeah, not, not only that, but a lot of guys had gone to the USFL, so, um, you know, the NFL wanted to keep a lot of quality athletes in the draft. He had a good, solid NFL career but that just spoke to the overall lack of depth in the draft that 
he would be taken first overall. Irving Fryer has certainly uh, been the top pick for several days since that April 4th trade. Now Houston is up and Sign Killer is signed and sealed and delivered. Let's now uh, hear their pick. Another Nebraskan. Guard, offensive guard, Dean Steinkuhler, Nebraska. It is the first time since 1967 that the first two picks in an NFL draft to come from the same college. That's when Bubba Smith and Clinton Jones out of Michigan State went number one and number two. There's little doubt that if Mike Rozier had not signed with the USFL, the first three players taken in the 1984 draft all would have been from the same school, which had never happened before and has not happened since. Three Huskers right in a row. Bang, bang, bang. Surprise, Chuck. I've been number one. Um, I don't know, Dean or Irv would be number two. And one of them would be number three. I don't think that was the case because of what I was told by New England. I was their choice that year. So I was going to be the first pick anyway. The first two picks were quick. The rest of the day was not. The 12-round draft took 18 hours and 42 minutes to complete. This deal just made the, the preparation a little different because you're going to go through the whole thing in, in one day, so you didn't have that break. It was just a long, long day. It was the marathon draft. Marathon. I think we started at 8 o'clock in the morning or whatever, and you're going to like midnight. We had service, food, coffee throughout the day constantly. We even had a masseuse there. Bill would have people take walks around the, uh, the building, and uh, it, it was a long, long day. Are coming up with the supplemental draft, both of USFL players and Canadian Football League players. Yes, we'll have that three rounds. That will be in uh, probably June. One month after the NFL draft, the league held the supplemental draft, laying claim to players in the USFL. We pretty much knew that it wasn't going to last. We saw the, how the operations were going, and yeah, and then now we, we expect that, well, if and when this league, league folds, we got to be prepared. How are we going to get these players? Just didn't want to go out and say they're all free agents, because now the market's going to drive way up to the sky. Free agency was still a decade away. The NFL was not yet ready to open that can of worms. They were the bully on the block. But I'm sure there was the feeling that I mean, we're the NFL. We can do anything we want. We rule the world. I think it just wound up being a matter of what's the smoothest way to bring these players into the league without starting an all-out bidding war. Subsequently, there was the supplemental draft, of which you were very much... Don't, uh, I, I, might, I might have to spit if you say that again. When Steve Young signed with the USFL, he had hoped for a merger of leagues. Worst case scenario in his mind, the USFL folds and he becomes a free agent for NFL teams to bid on. The idea that there was a supplemental draft never even crossed my mind, ever. It don't mean nothing, it really don't, it really don't. Looking back, maybe if I would have known that that was going to happen, it might have, I don't know if it might have changed it enough, it was, but when it did happen, it was, I was crestfallen about it. Tampa needed a quarterback when they traded their first round pick in the May draft to Cincinnati for Jack Thompson. That pick ended up being number one overall. Now, in a twist of fate, they held the number one pick in the supplemental draft, and Steve Young was available. It was between him and Reggie White, and we already had Leroy Selman. But we thought, if we uh, match this guy up with Selman, then nobody's going to be able to block us. But then we also thought, hey, we don't have a quarterback here, so we went with Steve Young. I certainly didn't watch it or understand that that was happening. I didn't watch it live or, you know, I, I was just told. It wasn't, oh, I'm going to be a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. I mean, it was just like, oh, geez, now I've got to deal with the reality that if something goes bad, I can't just pick my team. With the USFL on life support, Young jumped to the NFL in 1985. But he was just 3 and 16 as the Buccaneer starter over the next two years and was on the move again when Tampa traded him to San Francisco. And Steve was consigned to the very thing that he had tried to avoid as he entered football in 1984, which is sitting behind a hero and an icon who was successful. For those caught in the actual NFL draft, 
the results were mixed. To summarize this, the 49th NFL player draft, it will not go down as one of the more memorable moments in sports. Former football stars in their neighborhood bars. There's one thing that kind of reminds me of this band, and that's the fact that, okay, just the 84 NFL draft. In that entire draft class, not a single member is in the Hall of Fame current. And neither are we. And neither are we. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of like that little engine that could mentality. Because you look down that list, and there are some great players. Ernest Biner is a good example. Guy just worked his tail off. How about it, guys? Huh? Yeah. Yeah.